Um, if the appellant desires to reserve any time for rebuttal, you may do so. There's a clock in the podium. It will indicate how much time you have left, including your rebuttal time. So if it says 10 minutes, that includes your 10, your, whatever you've reserved for rebuttal. Um, it says, did, did you say each side has how much time? You have, each side has 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Um, to assist you, you should be aware that we have read the briefs in this case, looked at the record, uh, read the case, case law, and are familiar with the issues. Um, so you can guide yourself accordingly. And we've also conferenced the case. Um, e even though each side has 20 minutes, if um, you're done talking and you don't have anything to add and we don't have any more questions, there's no need to use up the 20 minutes. You can just sit down. Uh, finally, you should be aware that we are both audio and video recording these proceedings. So when you step up to the podium, for purposes of that recording, please clearly state your name and who you're representing, smile for the cameras, and then begin. So with that, uh, counsel for the appellant. May it please the court, my name is Jack Levine and I represent uh, the appellant uh, Andrea Haven. <clears throat> and uh, your honors, uh, I must confess that um, I am somewhat puzzled as to why I am even here. Because the principle that I am um, asserting here in this case is centuries old in the common law. Uh, the, the problem, uh, and, that, and, that, and that principle existed up until, in Arizona up until the year 2000 when the Court of Appeals issued its opinion in Larson versus Decker, which totally muddled the water on this issue. I suspect that many uh, did, of our... Did Larson muddle the water or did it help clarify in unique circumstances? Well, I say it, it muddled uh, the, the waters, Your Honor, because the Larson versus Decker case had absolutely nothing to do with the issue on this appeal, which is whether you need a, the, the testimony of a physician to introduce medical bills into evidence. The Larson versus Decker case had to do with the issue of causation. And the reason that that, that case muddled the water is because the court used the phrase reasonably and necessarily, necessarily related to the accident. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was clearly a statement of, of causation, not, not the reasonableness of medical bills. And, and, and you can look at that opinion, and if you don't read it carefully, you can conclude that the court was talking about the reasonableness of the medical bills, because the, the, uh, the discussion about medical bills came <laughs> Uh, 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 s somewhat close to that to that uh, to that statement, so uh, that's why I say it muddled the waters. Well, wouldn't you have to though show whether through your client or uh, custodians of record or certification that those bills had a relationship to the accident? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So what you're distinguishing is the difference between getting them in uh, and then uh, being able to tell the jury that uh, they're related to the accident. Okay. What I'm talking about is the issue of relevance. The foundation for the admission of medical bills is to show that they're relevant. And to show that they're relevant, you have to show causation to the accident. That's, that's what I'm saying. Okay. Okay. Now, I suspect that the problem uh, that we have had in the trial courts uh, is that the principles here are so basic that our judges look at it and say, oh, there's, there's got to be more. There's, you, you've got to show more than just, you know, the admission, the, just the medical bills. Well, isn't that, the, isn't that the fundamental issue in this case, at least 
uh, based on the case as it was tried, is the um, <clears throat> uh, the um, lack of causation evidence. I mean, the bills. If you'd had a custodian or got uh, or obtained a certification from one of the the medical records custodian, the the bills can come in if there's a proper foundation. But then there's the issue of causation. Just because the bill says I'm treated and I received this this treatment or this modality doesn't mean it is causally related to the accident. And that's where it appears that the evidence uh, came was came up short. Okay, uh, Your Honor. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, the only medical witness uh, on the plaintiff's side who was permitted to testify was Dr. Freeberg. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in his testimony, he clearly stated that in his, his, his opinion, uh, the condition was related to the accident. Okay? Now, there's another thing here to consider. Did the court preclude the other doctors from testifying? You from calling the other doctors? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. So you couldn't have called any of the other doctors for any purpose? Well, um, to say that they had treated I, I'm her? I'm sorry. Let, let me amend this. Um, the court didn't preclude me from calling the doctors. It precluded me from introducing their records. Oh, OK. Their records. And, and that, we submit, was in error because the, the court erred because the defendant represented to the court that the records of these other doctors had not been disclosed. Did you, did you, did the other doctors testify? I'm sorry? Did you have the other doctors testify? No, Your Honor, I did not. Mm -hmm. I did not. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I wasn't ever planning on having these other doctors testify. Well, your you disclosure, them in the disclosure, disclosure statement. statement. Pardon me? Your disclosure, your 15th and 16th disclosure statements all, all said that these other doctors were going to testify. Well, yeah, that was, that was, uh, that was, uh, Potential, yes, but you see, the, the, the problem is that when you have 10, 11, 12 doctors that have treated your client, uh, if you have to pay these doctors several thousands of dollars each to come and testify, uh, you're, you're going to bankrupt uh, the, the plaintiff and, uh, and, and it's probably going to be more than, than the damages that the plaintiff may receive. So, so that's a practical problem. I mean, I, you know, if Dr. Freeberg was not available, then I would have gone to the next name. But I wanted to be sure that we had disclosed these doctors and, uh, and basically what they would testify to. Did Dr. Freeberg, and I can't remember this, did Dr. Freeberg testify that all of the other doctors' treatments were, were made necessary because of the, were caused by the accident? He wasn't permitted to give that opinion or to give that testimony. And uh, again, now they he were, could testify as to all of the things that he did and all of and a number of other medical records that had been in his file up to a certain date. Correct. And that was a key that was a key issue in the in the court below. What happened here? Uh, this case was previously appealed. The first case, the first appeal was based on the defendant's representation that the case had been settled, whereas in fact it had not been settled. It had been dismissed on the basis of the defendant's representation. So we had to appeal that. And the, and the Court of Appeals held, no, there was no agreement to settle the case and sent it back down. Um, and so uh, back in 2008, uh, which, uh, which was before the appeal, the defendant had subpoenaed um, all of the doctor's records, and all those subpoenas are attached as an appendix to the appellant's reply brief. There's just, oh gosh, a whole score of, of, of subpoenas issued. And in response to those subpoenas, the defendant got a whole bunch of medical records up to the date of the subpoena, which is 2008. Okay. And I, I suspect that what happened is that these records went into a file, and when the case came back from the Court of Appeals, and we, we were getting ready to try the case um, in the court below in connection with, 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 with this matter, the defendant looked at its file and said, oh, I've got all these records at the end in 2008, so that must be all the records that we have. Well, in fact, I had filed, 
I don't know, 10, 11, 12 supplemental disclosure statements. The last one was a 15th disclosure statement, which is attached in, in total to our reply brief. I just put a skeleton copy in our opening brief. But you'll see at the top of the disclosure statement, it was received on May 29th, 2012. The defendant received that. It had all the records, all the bills. And so the defendant's representation that it didn't have these records and bills was wrong. It was a misrepresentation to the court. It was a false representation. Well, I'm wasn't, not it, wasn't it corrected during the trial courts at trial just before Dr. Freeberg testified uh, as to, you know, what you had done and the fact that you had provided a lot more because clearly by the 16th supplemental disclosure. Yeah, 15th, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you had, you know, continued to update and do the things that you needed to do under uh, oh. 26.1. Judge Portley, that, that, was, that, that was one of the most frustrating things that occurred in this case. I did bring in that disclosure statement. I showed it to the judge, and he basically didn't want to look at it. Because his, I think his mood was, well, I've already made up my mind based on the pretrial conference which we had a month ago, and I don't want to, you know, reconsider things. I, I, mean, I thought the judge, because of that, then let Dr. Freeberg testify about his continuing treatment of Ms. Haven. Only up to, um, only up to um, the, the date in... Um, wasn't it April and, of 2009? Yes, only up to April of 2009. Yes, he permitted him to testify only up to that date. Did he treat Ms. Haven after April 2009? Oh, yeah. Treated her right up until 2000, early part of 2012. And you're saying, uh, and forgive me, and you're saying that you disclosed the uh, April 2009 through 2012 Dr. Freeberg, Freeberg, excuse me, Freeberg records? Absolutely. Absolutely. But the defendant was not aware of that, I, I believe. Mm -hmm. Because all he had was the records that had been subpoenaed in 2008. And I'm not, you know, I'm not suggesting that the defendant did this purposely. It could happen. Mm -hmm. It was just, you know, a, a negligent um, oversight. But it certainly prejudiced um, my client in the presentation of her evidence. Anyway, um, I, wanted, I want to say that if you look at, 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 at rules 401 and 402, th these are the codifications of the common law rule. This permits, this permits medical bills to be introduced into evidence if it creates a reasonable inference that the bills are reasonable, and if there's foundation that there's a causation between the treatment and the accident. But that's the problem. I Forgive me, Mr. Levine. Here's where I'm having the, the stumbling okay. uh, in my own mind. Uh, I can see the bills coming in I can, if you have the proper foundation. Um, but the problem I'm having is the what appears to be, from the record, a lack of causation evidence that the treatments and the modalities that were rendered by the other health care providers were causally related to the accident. And I'm having a hard time knowing where is the testimony that was, would have, that you presented. And where I see the problem is that you didn't present that testimony because the court said you have not disclosed, made appropriate expert disclosure of one doctor who can basically tie it all together. And, you, you, and I don't see anything in the record in which you had made that okay, disclosure. I'll, ex I'll explain, Your Honor. Okay. The proof of causation is in the medical records of all of the other doctors, all of which were disclosed to the, def to the defendant. These records were excluded by the court because of the defendant's misrepresentation. And if those records had come in, there would have been more than adequate uh, evidence of causation. So, so, so that's, that's the problem. You're saying that the medical records in and of and by themselves would have contained uh, um, uh, statements such as, I've treated Ms. Haven today and I provided this service or that service, and I've determined that um, these services or these treatments were causal related to the accident with the truck and not her pre-existing 
conditions. There will be statements that clear in these medical records. Correct. If you look at the appendix number one to our opening brief, which is the emergency room record from Desert Banner, uh, uh, Banner Desert Medical Center, you will see um, under the history of present illness, um, this is a 50-year-old female who was walking through a parking garage when an SUV did, uh, did, did see her, it should be, I think, did not see her, and, and nearly ran over her. She says that she put her hands out and pushed herself away from the vehicle and fell onto her left buttock. She is having severe pain. She is unable to bear weight on the left leg. Apparently, the truck was going at a low speed. She had no loss of consciousness and denies any head injury. Well, how is that proof of causation, uh, that this accident... I mean, there's no question she was in an accident with the truck and she's now experiencing pain, but we still have the underlying issue, which is where is the medical evidence that these symptoms that she reported to, for example, the emergency room doctor, are related to the accident and really not related to a pre-existing condition? You've shown a sequence of time, but where's the causation? Okay. Well, Your Honor, I submit that, that the, the sequence of time can be one factor in establishing causation. There's another statement in the, in the emergency room record. It says, she complains of left buttock pain and pain in the left hip and proximal femur. Mm -hmm. the, he, the, the history is she was struck by the vehicle and fell on her left side, on, on, on her left leg. So I think when you read that, it's, it's pretty clear that, that, that this accident caused her complaints. I, or at least, you know, you can infer that it did. I mean, you know, there's... Um, well, based upon the rest of the record, would it then you know, really an aggravation of her pre-existing complaints? Because at least as I read Dr. Freeberg's testimony, he noted that she had been complaining a few days before the accident of pain. Yes, but, but, but the, the pain was from her back. It went, it went down her legs, but, but he pretty clearly testified that it was this accident that caused the injury to her, to her hip, to her left hip. He testifies about that clearly. Yeah. And, okay. So um, I, I think that there's enough causation there uh, to provide a foundation for the admission of these medical bills. Now, uh, one other thing I have to say, and that is that um, every court in the country uh, that has decided this issue, if you exclude the Larson versus Decker case and the, uh, the case um, uh, that uh, Larson cites uh, up in um, Washington, up in Washington, which also coincidentally um, had nothing to do with the uh, reasonable of medical bills. It was also a causation issue, um, and 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 interestingly, well, one of the cases you cited from Arkansas a few years earlier in Gray versus Stratford, the court said something familiar, something similar to at least Larson. No foundation was laid to establish a causal relationship between the accident and the hospital expenses. Right. That's causal relationship. That's a different issue. Well, but that's part of the issue in this case because of the pre-existing condition. Well, you know, that, that certainly is an issue. But, but you see, w w we're not here to determine what the jury should have determined about that issue. All we're here to determine is was there sufficient evidence of causation to permit these bills to come into evidence for the jury's consideration. That's, that's, what, that's all we're talking about. And you know, let me ask you one other question about the bills, because I, I have looked at them. Um, the jury can look at them as well, and they see information of, and uh, statements about pain and discomfort, and, and you know the records better than I do. But the, I'm, again, the concern I have is this is not apparent to a lay person or a lay jury. And they needed, I would have thought, expert testimony, expert medical testimony, to help them understand what these records mean and what they can infer from them. And again, I come back to the, the problem I have is, even if the records lend some support to causation, you still needed expert testimony to have an opinion that, in fact, these 
these uh, problems that Ms. Haven was having are either an aggravation of a pre-existing condition or um, new injuries in the accident or uh, the cause of caused by the accident. Dr. Friedberg dealt with that issue also, Your Honor, and he, he testified that uh, this was um, this was a new injury, not a not a pre-existing injury. And, and he testified that all of the other doctors' treatments of her were related to this new injury. No, he wasn't permitted to testify he about that. that. And and because the, the judge uh, erroneously concluded that um, if you're a doctor, you're an expert witness, even though you're a treating doctor. See, that was the big argument that we right, had. Right, but then there's a difference between when you say, I, Dr. Freeberg, treated her for these things, and they were related, and, and they were related to the cause of accident, where you might be a fact witness under Sanchez, and Dr. Freeberg coming in and saying, and doctors A, B, C, D, and E treated her, and that was all necessary and reasonable based on caused by the accident, where then he becomes an expert. Under well, Sanchez, right? Your Honor, you, I agree with that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If, if he gives an opinion based on what other doctors did, then he puts on his expert hat, at least for that testimony. I, but I wanted to point out, Judge Norris, that there's additional evidence of causation. That is, the fact that my client had, uh, I don't think she, she barely ever missed a day of work before this accident, but after the accident, she couldn't work at all. I mean, she, she worked at home for, you know, five or six weeks. She tried to go to this convention in California, and then because of the pain, she had to quit, and she hasn't worked since. So um, that's it. Hey, Mr. Levine, you're out of time. Uh, okay, yeah, um, I figured that. Um, any, unless there are any other questions. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honors. This is Tim O'Connor, and I'm here on behalf of uh, Kevin. Um, I will try to focus my comments on the questions that you posed to Mr. Levine. Um, one thing with respect to the causation issue that I think is very illuminating is the fact that while Mr. Levine did disclose a large sum of records um, with respect to treatment for Ms. Haven after the accident, not once, not once was there ever a record that he identified as not being related to the accident, as being related to her pre-existing condition. So in essence, what they were trying to do is say, okay, yes, she has this pre-existing condition, but you know what? Anything and everything after that, we want to tie into the accident. And the problem, as you have all identified, is that they needed an expert to come in and say that, and they did not. Um, a couple of other questions that were posed about... Um, well, why couldn't what? Dr. Freeberg be you know, used as the treating physician if he had you know, uh, reviewed all of the records uh, you know, to at least opine subject to cross-examination and your Dr. Harden and you know, sure. the other evidence? No, he, he would have been allowed to had it been properly disclosed. Um, the, the issue that the, <clears throat> the trial court picked up on was early on um, there, were, there was the subpoena that we sent out for Dr. Freeberg's records. There were some other health care provider records in that subpoena response, and the trial court said, yes, okay, Dr. Freeberg, you're allowed to talk about those from, I believe, it was August prior. The issue is that after that, there was never any disclosure that Dr. Freeberg would be reviewing all of these other health care providers' records. You're referring to the 15th and 16th disclosure statements? Correct. Correct. And it was never disclosed to us that he would be putting on that expert hat and looking at a myriad of other health care providers' uh, treatment. Um, and, and the problem there is that that put certainly the defense uh, well, number one, it's bad, it's an inadequate disclosure, but then it puts us uh, in a, in a it prejudices the defense because we made the tactical decision that we're not going to go depose Dr. Freeberg, thinking he's just going to come in as the treating doctor limited to his records up through April. And then we get the call from Mr. Levine roughly a month before trial telling us, oh, by the way, I'm going to go send all of these health care provider records over to Dr. Freeberg, and he's going to come in and testify to causation as to every single one of these uh, treatments 
and that all the bills are reasonable and necessary, and that is an inadequate disclosure. Was that after the um, cutoff? Yes. And did you depose? I, I can't remember. Did you depose any of the other doctors? We did not. We did not. Although you did have notice from the 15th and 16th disclosure statements, and maybe earlier, that he intended to call them as witnesses. Uh, correct. Although, as a practical matter, when we get those disclosures in, the discovery deadline was coming up pretty quick, and whether we would have actually been able to depose those doctors within the time period, prob probably. But yeah, I mean, we made the tactical decision that we would not do that. And what was so, so this would have been a totally different case if he had. Ms. Haven had called these other doctors to testify. You wouldn't have, you had the opportunity to take their depositions and didn't. Well, we, we, we would have had the ability to cross-examine them based on their records. Right. And the big issue with Dr. Freeberg, among other things, is he's a family practice DO. And a number of these other health care providers that he was at least going to be called in to testify about, uh, uh, to testify <coughs> about, like, for example, reasonableness of the bills, we're talking about pain management specialists, we're talking about neurologists, we're talking about physiatrists, all areas that at least had we n had proper disclosure on it, we would have been filing motions in limine and, and knocking out a lot of this stuff because he would not have been truly qualified to testify about the reasonableness and necessity of those treatments. I'm assuming that he didn't refer uh, uh, Ms. Haven to those specialists. Some of them he did. Okay. And did he get their reports back as part of his ongoing treatment? The best that I can say is that based on our subpoena from August of 2008, there were some records from other health care providers. But again, there was never any disclosure that, hey, all these other records have been provided to Dr. Freeberg and he is going to testify that that treatment is reasonable, causally related, and that the bills um, were necessary. How, how does all of that, what you've just told us, fit in with um, the Ms. Haven's argument that um, the court excluded some of the medical records based on um, misstatements by defense counsel uh, that um, the records had not been provided? How does all of that play in? And, and well, it, it plays in this way. The um, originally, when we looked at the records that had been disclosed, this is back in 2008. Back in 2008, we had those records, and when we went before the trial judge, we said our, our position was: Listen, judge, we have not been provided any records from Dr. Freeberg after August of 2008. Mm -hmm. And the trial court properly said, "Okay, we're going to limit Dr. Freeberg up to that date." When we went back, went through the hundreds of records that were provided with those uh, later disclosures, we said, okay, look, we see that we made a mistake mm -hmm. and that it's actually April of 2009 that we have records up to. Um, and as you have seen, we went to the trial court and said, our mistake, he should be allowed. We didn't contest it. He should be allowed up through April of 2009 to testify about his treatment. And the trial court properly said, we will allow that. What about Mr. Levine's uh, statement uh, in oral argument just a few minutes ago that actually records um, had uh, uh, he or his client had disclosed records that went from April 2009 through 2012? I made a note of that, and I right. would respectfully disagree with Mr. Okay. Levine on that. Um, it's always hard to prove a negative, and I mean that respectfully. Is there anything where in the record I might go to? look and I'll ask, well, I guess I won't ask Mr. Levine that since his time is out, but is there any place I would, you would point me to? I believe Mr. Levine um, submitted the, is it 15th and 16th disclosure statements? Mm -hmm. I would guess that that's where you would look. Okay. Um, yeah. And I guess we could look at the pages of the trial transcript from the 28th or thereabouts to see if there's any additional statements about the post-2009 records? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Pages 38 through 54. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and the only other issue that I would like to address with, with your honors is um, with respect to this notion that there is an inference um, from a medical bill that simply because it has been paid is therefore reasonable and um, 
in today's day and age, I would submit to you that because of medical bills paid, it does not provide an inference that the bill is in fact reasonable. And the reason I say that is uh, we all know that health care costs have been skyrocketing over the last 10, 15, 20 years. Um, some of the case law that is being cited to by, by Mr. Levine date back 30, 40, 50 years long before the advent of health insurance, collateral sources, a lot of other issues. Um, we've all heard and seen, you know, the, well, but if, the if, article. If a litigant pays, inflated or not, wouldn't that be an indicia of reasonableness, uh, especially if that person, you know, in deposition or otherwise testified uh, about that? I would say not necessarily. Not, well, well, wouldn't it then be your responsibility as the defense to, to refute that? You would have an indicia, the jury could hear it, and if you could get your expert or someone else to say, yeah, you know that hundred dollar procedure was just for twenty bucks. Sure, you know, and we, then we, that's something they would have to resolve. Sure, we would we do that all the time. Yeah, but it is, it is plaintiff's burden. Plaintiff's burden to come in and initially establish that it's reasonable and necessary. It's not the defense, and what Mr. Levine is attempting to do is to shift that burden. Um, the the easy example we've all seen the articles on the internet and heard the stories about the hospital that charges 25 or 30 bucks for an aspirin. The simple fact of the matter is if I get that bill, I don't want it to go collect to collections. I don't want it to ruin my credit. So am I going to pay it? Yeah. But it doesn't mean it's a reasonable charge. Well, but if it's their filed charge, um, that the banner, uh, Jimmy the Baptist Hospital case says if it's their filed charge, mm -hmm. they have a right to enforce it. And, if, and your client, if they agreed to pay their standard rates, has to pay it. That's correct. So it begs the question, well, then what, what, is, what is the bill that is being quote-unquote paid? Is, is it how much the, that the hospital charges? Is it how much that your health insurance covers it? Is it your copay? The amount, well, I mean, if you're seeking damages, it's the amount of damages. The amount, the amount that's been paid. Whether it's by an insurance carrier or someone else, it's the amount because that's what we're here about. I mean, we're here about whether the the, the a, a plaintiff was injured and out of pocket on medical expenses, and if they paid the medical expenses and they were their filed rates, if it was a hospital rate as opposed to a doctor's rate, it was a hospital rate is what would have been been on file with the whether it's twenty five dollars for an aspirin, or if it's five cents for an aspirin. Is what was but, what was charged and paid. But would would the twenty five dollars for the aspirin, as the build rate, does, does that in and of itself establish that it's reasonable when you know your health insurance is only paying a buck on it? Well, I, I, I don't think I, on mm -hmm. on its face. I don't think the bill just because it's been paid mm -hmm. means it automatically provides this inference of reasonableness. There's there's too many other. Of course, factors. that puts the that puts the patient in a real bind, doesn't it? it certainly does. Patient gets the hospital bill. If they don't have insurance and they have to pay it, and then when they seek the seek to recover from a third-party tort feeder, third-party tort feeder says, "Well, I wasn't reasonable. Yeah. You shouldn't have had to pay that." Yeah, so they're then caught in the bind of either having the hospital sue them for their for their for the standard rates and not being able to collect from the third party. Yeah. Uh, I would I would submit that if it's good enough for the hospital to collect on, it should be deemed reasonable. Of course, that's not the issue here because th th these were doctor's rates. So right. we're really talking it, hypotheticals. True. It, it is not the issue that is presently before the court. And, was, was and, I, I, and, and I would submit to you that, that one, one way to look at it is, is this an attempt to backdoor getting around to where we are in the medical malpractice arena nowadays with them, with uh, defendants being allowed to bring in contracted rates or collateral sources? And uh, I, I would submit that this is not the forum or the case to be doing that, sure. but it is an issue. What, you know, Mr. Levine raises a good point, which is a lot of times on your disclosure statements, you will list anybody you think of thinking of calling a witness as a witness. And then once you call that down and say, okay, here are the people, the pre say the pretrial statement, mm -hmm. that type of thing, you've called it down. These are people we're really going to call. Was any effort made to, okay, fine, we've decided to now only call Dr. Freeberg on these on these other doctors' medical records and the reasonableness of their charges 
and let's extend the cutoff date to do that. So easier for everybody so we don't have to come in, we meaning Ms. Haven, doesn't have to come in with 15 different doctors? Yeah, absolutely. I, 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 if my recollection serves me correctly, that was the telephone call roughly 30 days before trial. And, but in the record, does that show a, does the record show that there was an effort to continue the cutoff date to, uh, to simplify things for trial? There was not any effort to continue the trial date. Uh, there was no effort to extend the discovery deadline. Um, we filed our motion in limine right afterwards and, and okay. brought the attention it to the attention of the court and we moved forward from there. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, thank both counsel for their arguments. We will take this matter under advisement um, and issue a written decision in due course. We'll take a brief recess to allow the attorneys for the, uh, the next case to, to come forward. Um, and if we're, once they're ready, if they're here and they're ready, we don't need to worry about waiting until the appointed time. But we stand in recess. Thank you. Thank you.